Good morning, members. Um, we have a quorum, and can I call the meeting to order? Uh, I'd like to welcome by telephone this morning the Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, Orlea, Flynn, Colin McGrath, Paula Bradshaw, and Pat Sheehan, who are participating in today's telephone conference by phone to ensure that we can maintain the social distancing and physical distancing regulations that we're, we're asked to comply, and I thank you for that. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, we don't have any apologies today. We have full attendance at the committee. Moving on to chairperson's business, um, the committee is aware that there is a, a, a issue of concern around abortion reg regulations and legislation. Um, we do have a number of officials briefing us today, and I want to ensure that we receive those very important briefings um, in relation to the COVID crisis. But I do want to indicate that, that we will certainly not leave today without discussing that issue in some detail. Um, so I'm uh, moving on then to the COVID-19 disease response, the departmental briefing. I advise members that officials are joining us by telephone, conferencing, so we can follow up on issues raised with us around adult social care during this crisis. So can I now welcome Mr. Sean Holland, Chief Social Worker. Sean, have you, have you, uh, Sean, are you online? Or Mark Lee, do you have, uh, Mark, are you online there? I am here, yes. Okay. Um, so we're awaiting, we're awaiting Sean Holland, and we'll, we'll just give that a, a few moments. Um, I will, uh, I will suggest that we will take a round of questions on a number of issues from all members, and then we'll ask the officials, Mark, yourself, and Sean, to deal with those questions on a theme in relation to care homes and uh, it may overlap into domiciliary care as well. So uh, we will we will we'll seek to keep. Yep. So Sean will be dialing in. Will we go ahead and start with Sean? Are you with us now? I am indeed, Colin. Sorry, I uh, made a mistake dialing in the first time round. So I'm just too late. No problem at all. We appreciate uh, we appreciate you. And so we now have confirmed that both yourself and. Mark are with us and are and can hear us okay, Sean and Mark, is that correct? Yep, hearing you loud and clear. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, well listen, I'll just I'll just so Sean and Mark there, Sean, you mightn't have heard this, but what we're going to do this morning to try to to try to get as a, as concise a response as possible is we'll take a round of questions from the members on two of the main themes that are emerging around this issue. The first of which being PPE and the second of which being testing. So I'll go to all members for a question, and if yourself and Mark could then deal with those as a theme, um, and we'll, we'll come back to you then, okay? Okay, no problem, Colin. So I will, I will take the questions then from people on the phone in the order on which I have them here on the paper. So I'll go first to, to Pam Cameron, their Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, both Sean and Mark, for your being present at the committee today. Um, just in terms, I'll just get straight to it, just in terms of the PPE issue, can you confirm that um, each of the trusts do have um, a full and ample supply of PPE equipment? And um, can you tell us if there is a single named point of contact for each of those trusts for the entire care sector to um, liaise with in order to get that PPE uh, in a timely manner, and could you also tell us if the guidance for the use of PPE has been updated, and if so, when was that updated? Okay, um, I'll try and take you through. Sean, yep. I'll just hold you there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go around all the members with questions related to PPE at this point, to, to group the questions so, so that you can answer the questions in that fashion. Okay, Colin, um, that's fine. The only thing is, can I beg forgiveness in case um, we miss a point? I'm sure you'll pick us up and bring us back to it. We, we will. We will pick up, and or we'll, we'll try to pick up on that. Um, I wanted to also ask, in terms of in terms of the PPE, what mechanisms are in place to get that PPE out to care homes and to domiciliary and to domiciliary care that ensures that those workers are being provided with the with the equipment that they need, but also what 
uh, plans and what procedures are in place to provide the correct training to use the PPE in a proper fashion. And the final question from me in relation to that is around the issue of guidance and, and how guidance is varying across trust areas. We're picking up from, from uh, workers and from <coughs> care settings that guidance across different trusts is different. And I want to know what is being done to harmonise and to make sure the same guidance is, is, is available. Okay, I will now go to um, Orlea Flynn for a question, PPE. Yes, thank you, Colin, um, Sean and Mark. I just wanted to ask, I'm not sure if you will be able to put a figure on this, um, but are you aware of, due to the, the lack, some of the gaps in PPE um, and testing within the car home settings, are you aware of um, how many car home staff are being prevented to go into their place of work? Um, because of the lack of um, of those PPE products. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Orlea is, uh, and Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Sean and Mark. Um, my question uh, is around the difference between the PPE that is to be worn in hospital and in the community. In hospital, it's more or less worn on all occasions because people are confirmed as having had um, some form of the, the, the virus. But out in the community, it's only when somebody is suspected of having the virus. And, and that means that when they are asymptomatic in the period before that, there is very minimal, maybe just a pair of gloves and washing of hands. That's where staff are telling me that they're feeling most vulnerable. It's when the symptoms haven't presented and then they're moving from house to house. Um, that was in the briefing note that we have in our, our paper today. Can I ask, is that still the case? That in the community, they only wear PPE um, when the case is suspected uh, or else is confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I now move into Paula. Bradshaw, please. Good morning, everyone. I, I want to ask about those um, people who are in receipt of direct payments, i.e. that they um, arrange and pay for their own care at home. How are they being catered for in the distribution of PPE? Thank you. Thank you. And Pat Sheehan. Thanks, Chair. Um, I want to raise the issue in the briefing paper around PPE and ventilators of ECMOs. Uh, my understanding from the Minister last week is that there are no ECMOs here in the north. Pat, and he I, Pat, said, I, Pat, I prefer to keep this just on PPE at this stage. If you could bring that in, we will be doing a further round. Um, okay, but if you could just focus on the PPE element of your question. I, I, I'll wait for that coming in the next round. Okay, okay thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I have uh, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, just around the PPE in car homes, obviously there's a lot of um, questions specifically today uh, about this, Sean. Um, my understanding is there's still a bit of confusion on whether it's the department who are responsible uh, for supplying it or whether it's the provider um, themselves. So a bit of clarity on that will be um, useful. Um, and, and if it's a, responsible, a responsibility of the provider, um, does the RQIA still have a role in monitoring um, that? Uh, and in terms of um, issues ra raised around safeguarding in the, in the recent sort of period, um, do these issues will they still be investigated, um, and is there still a chance for um, uh, for people to raise concerns about the trust around care homes and on other issues? And I, th I think this week is, is evidence that we do need a, a different approach to PPE when when orders um, were put in place, and I think we need to rely on a different approach that isn't uh, market driven. So, um, yeah, uh, a response on that would be good. Thanks. Okay, and finally for now on this issue, uh, Alex. Oh, Alan, sorry. Apologies, Thanks, Alan. Chair. Alan. Uh, Chair, I just come in, uh, uh, in behind really Palm's question is the, you know, I, I had been reading uh, guidance in, uh, in our pack, uh, and it seemed to be fairly minimal. Uh, PPE recommended uh, for domiciliary workers, and I, I understand that that may have been updated. So, really, my question is uh, have they, the, the trusts been providing even that minimal? Uh, amount of equipment that the guidance has laid down. Yep. Okay, Sean, that, that is our first round of questions. Now, I'm conscious that we went straight to questions there, but if you do want to do a, a very quick briefing and then get into the questions, that, that's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over now to both yourself and Mark, and if you want to indicate there uh, which of you are speaking. 
Okay, Colin. Um, I have to be honest, it's going to be a challenge to recall all the elements of the different questions that people have asked. Um, I was furiously taking notes as you went through. So I'll try and address them, but um, and I'll ask Mark then to uh, uh, follow up and add further points. But you'll probably need to come back to me um, to, to uh, re-engage on things that maybe I haven't covered. In terms of an opening statement, I'm aware that time's pressing, so I really, um, although I have one prepared, I'm going to dispense with it. The only thing I will say is I feel I have to start by paying tribute to the workers in the system. And when I say that, I want to make it really clear I'm talking about trust staff and independent sector staff and those staff who are working in the voluntary and community sector. Uh, there can't be any differentiation between them. And I can't say that enough. Uh, neither uh, employer, nor salary, nor status can differentiate them, it, particularly in terms of the courage and commitment they're showing uh, by turning up to work every day. Um, this is a really challenging time. And I think we have to be really honest. It's a very frightening time. It's a scary time. And these people are turning up to work uh, in the face of that. So I, I just that's all I really want to say by, by way of an opening statement um, uh, to, to, to acknowledge that and to pay tribute to that. OK, on to PPE. Um, I'll start with the general position um, uh, and then go through some elements. Uh, and, and I'll pause every now and then and ask Mark to, to, to uh, add. The first point is responsibility for PPE. Um, the primary responsibility for PPE rests with the provider of a service. That's the normal expectation, and that's the first port of call. However, we recognize that the circumstances we're in are anything but normal. So what we have done is uh, made it clear that there can be no differentiation between uh, the trusts and the independent sector in terms of PPE. So it's not a case of trusts have a stock of PPE and uh, they look after their own first and then look to the independent sector. We have explicitly, absolutely explicitly instructed trusts that they need to assess the need to allocate PPE on the basis of where it will be most effective. And that should not respect organizational boundaries at all. Uh, so uh, the independent sector are to look to trusts where they have a need for PPE that they, current, that they can't meet at any particular time. Uh, that's a clear direction. That's come from the minister. That has come from myself. Uh, that is the policy. And I want to make it absolutely clear that's the policy. So um, while uh, we are hearing, obviously, anecdotal instances where there are issues arising to PPE, I want to be really, really clear. The policy is that PPE is allocated on the basis of need. Um, the trusts uh, are not to view the stocks that they are in possession of as being their stock. They are stocks for the people of Northern Ireland and to be used in whatever way is most effective in protecting those people. Now, uh, in terms then of how we manage that, uh, one of the things that we've done um, and was established quite early on was to stand down the RQIA from a lot of their routine inspection activity uh, and instead become a source of uh, support for the independent sector. So we have um, uh, retasked all the people who normally would be working as inspectors to act as uh, support for uh, the um, independent sector. And they provide a first point of contact to provide advice and support to the independent sector. Now, that team has been up and running since the 25th of March, and providers can contact them online um, to check in with them, or they can also call them. Uh, the service is regularly getting uh, about 100 contacts a day uh, from providers, and a sample of that one day, and I've got the information on, from the 7th of April, there were 105 contacts from the uh, 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 sector. 86% of those contacts basically said, look, we're just checking in with you. We're okay. Um, we don't have any particular issues uh, uh, at the moment. Eight providers on that day raised queries about PPE. Um, and there were a number of discussions with them about uh, the challenges they were facing. Um, and, and again, the policy is reiterated and people are directed towards uh, the trust if they don't have sufficient supplies and stocks uh, to respond to uh, um, uh, the, the needs of the individual organization. In addition to um, accessing uh, their own supplies and in addition to looking at the supplies of PPE that can be provided uh, from trusts, the... Um, We've been 
really pleasantly um, uh, heartened by the number of people who've been contacting um, different parts of the healthcare system with offers of PPE assistance. Um, different people are coming forward saying, listen, I have some PPE, I've got some masks, I have gloves, what can we do with those? Now, there are arrangements for large-scale central procurement, but the RQIA has set up a system whereby uh, they uh, will be notified um, via the Department of Finance's Central Procurement Directive, uh, Directorate whenever these offers come forward. And if they're not deemed of a suitable uh, scale for the business support organisation to include in their overall allocation, these offices, offers are then being forwarded to the R RQIA, who are then notifying the providers that uh, if they want to call on, on these supplies, they can do so. Um, and that is happening. Uh, so, so those arrangements are, are, are in place. Now, um, moving to guidance. Um, there is guidance uh, in place for the use of PPE in a variety of settings, in, in care homes and in domiciliary care. I think there was a reference in uh, one of the questions to different guidance coming from different trusts. Um, that is not uh, an acceptable position. We are working under uh, one um, a source of guidance. That guidance comes from the Public Health Agency. Um, it's informed by um, expert uh, advice. Uh, it is not for individual trusts to issue different guidance about how you use PPE. Uh, it is central guidance and it is guidance for the whole system. Uh, so uh, not necessarily in this session. If anyone has issues with uh, guidance other than that being used or being issued, please, um, uh, outside of this conversation, raise that with us and we'll, we'll, we'll pursue that. We should be following central guidance from the Public Health Agency, um, uh, which is incorporated into a number of other guidance documents uh, which we're producing, uh, and that's the guidance that should be followed, and that is informed by expert advice. Um, well, Sean, I'm sorry, Sean, I'm, just, I'm, just to yeah. interrupt you there. Are you aware? Are, are you aware of the guidance that's being issued by each of the trusts, and that there, are you aware that there are variations? No, I'm not aware of there being variations. I'm aware of guidance being issued by uh, the Department and the Public Health Agency. Um, so, for example, we've issued guidance to care homes, guidance covering a range of areas. Within that guidance, it covers the issue of uh, PPE. And what we have used in that has been the uh, guidance that has originated from the Public Health Agency. The same is true in the guidance we've issued to domiciliary care providers. And, and do you have any update on the review of PPE guidance mentioned by the Minister at last week's meeting, which would ha obviously be potentially very significant for care sector? Where's that review, yeah. Where's that review at? Uh, what I would say is that uh, PPE use, along with a number of different uh, uh, aspects of the challenge we're facing, is under continuous review. Um, and I'm going to ask Mark to come in in a second to give you the latest on where we're at in terms of reviewing PPE guidance. Uh, but what I would say is that uh, there have been um, uh, a, a review to try and make sure that uh, there's greater clarity about the use of PPE. Um, and it's also intended to uh, help people um, uh, feel reassured about the circumstances when they should be using PPE and what PPE to be used in particular settings. I think one of the questions um, asked about the difference between uh, what was being used, say, in domiciliary care and what was being used in acute healthcare settings. Uh, there is a difference between the PPE that's required for different tasks. Um, so uh, where you're engaged in particular procedures, processes, um, a higher level of protection is advised than where you're involved in uh, procedures which don't uh, generate those particular risks. Okay. Um, so there are differences from the PPE for different settings. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and say, Mark, could you give us the most up-to-date position on the uh, guidance and the review of it? Yes, yeah, so um, new guidance on PPE broadly was issued on, I think, either Thursday or possibly Friday of last week. That was um, issued on a on a um, sort of UK-wide basis, so it was published by Public Health England, but it was um, uh, agreed by uh, the public health bodies uh, in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales as well, and has their, has their badges on it. That, that I think it has some, some very useful tables that set out um, to pick up one of the questions um, and build on Sean's point. It sets out the different PPE needed in different scenarios. 
So as Sean said, where there's a aerosol generating procedures, uh, there's a much higher level of PPE needed, and that's where you sometimes find that in the more acute bits of the hospital. Um, that that guidance was as I said, published last week. We are working to take out the, the relevant bits of that guidance for uh, domiciliary care and for care homes and to put that into a revision to our guidance to those sections, uh, to those sectors. Uh, I apologise. So I know um, some trusts have been seeking to interpret that guidance that was published uh, at the end of last week. Uh, for their providers, we we have asked them to make sure they're not sending out um, any documentation that they have created, um, uh, and just to await uh, the revised sexual guidance that we will be publishing uh, very shortly, which will draw out from that guidance published at the end of last week the uh, most relevant parts for dom care and for care homes. And when you say very shortly, Mark, what what do you mean? What, what are we looking at? Uh, so dom care, I would, um, if not today, then tomorrow, uh, care home one might take us a day, possibly two days longer than that. Okay. Um, okay, can I come back to some of the other points? Yes, um, I think has... training was mentioned. Yes. Um, uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind that um, the need to use PPE in relation to, to this particular pandemic we're facing um, is not entirely unique. Working in care homes and working in domiciliary care, you are working with people who um, often have very compromised uh, health. Um, they often are experiencing a number of comorbidities. And so infection control is always really important. Um, I mean, I think people uh, mistakenly in the early days of this pandemic compared it to the flu. It's clear that COVID-19 is not the flu. Um, but for a lot of the clients who live in care homes um, and uh, who are in domiciliary care, the flu is a much more deadly illness than it is for the broader population. And so it's always been the case that staff have been trained in infection control, and that includes the use of PPE. In the current uh, situation, employers have been uh, undertaking both direct training for their staff, uh, where they are increasing their workforces, but also to reinforce the awareness of uh, uh, infection control measures um, and in particular we've seen a huge jump in the use of online training. Um, uh, some employers have their own online training packages but I have to commend the Northern Ireland Social Care Council who have an excellent online resource which is open access, I mean it's free to everyone, uh, that anyone can use it and that includes uh, infection control training um, uh, which uh, is open to anyone working in this sector but is also I'd have to say, open to anyone. Um, we've uh, a lot of members of the public now choosing to undertake this online training, um, and I would encourage everyone to do so. So training is in place, and it is happening. I think there was also a question, I think, from Jerry about safeguarding. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been doing across a whole range of activities is standing down a lot of things that we routinely do, relaxing requirements for certain things, not doing things that we normally do. This is not business as usual. However, there are some things that uh, we feel it's absolutely essential we continue to do. And amongst those are safeguarding um, uh, work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and I know this is broader than, than, than um, uh, care homes, uh, but unfortunately we know that during a period of lockdown uh, that we're in from looking at other countries um, that have experienced this, there is likely to be a significant rise of uh, a, a need for safeguarding responses. Domestic violence, we know, um, um, unfortunately, seems to be on the rise in, in uh, settings when you're going through this. Child protection issues, the same. And so adult safeguarding arrangements remain extant. Uh, the usual arrangements are in place. If people have an adult safeguarding concern, um, they can report it and it will be responded to. Uh, this is one of the services that uh, as we have uh, staff becoming ill um, uh, and services coming under pressure, we redeploy staff. We are maintaining our adult safeguarding service. Um, there, there was also a question from Orlea in relation to how many staff, have you an assessment of how many staff have been prevented from going to work as a result of not having PPE? Um, 
I don't have a precise assessment of that. Um, I hope that we will be getting more detailed information uh, in, in the days and weeks as, as we, we go ahead. Currently, um, certainly the uh, sector is under pressure because of staff um, not uh, turning up to work. But so far, the reports we have from providers are that that pressure is uh, manageable. Uh, they are also recruiting additional staff into the sector. What we do have in place and we are strengthening on a daily basis are the arrangements whereby if a care home were to find itself uh, seriously challenged because of the number of staff who weren't able to come to work, uh, that we will have the ability to support that care home, both by moving staff around between different providers, also by using uh, trust staff to support that care home. And uh, we are hoping in the coming days to also include the uh, huge resource that has been made available to us by people coming forward uh, and saying that they wish to volunteer or people who have left the workforce and saying they're wishing to return to the workforce, uh, we will be drawing upon all of those resources to make sure that if a care home is experiencing very high levels of staff absence for whatever reason, the resources will be wrapped around that care home to make sure that uh, the, the care home can continue to, to function. I would like to, I mean, it's, it's really invidious to single out particular groups of people, but uh, I, I would like to uh, pay tribute to, uh, we have some very young uh, student nurses and uh, student social workers who are joining the workforce um, to offer their services um, and, and a lot of those are, are in the front line in terms of being available to be redeployed to, to care homes. Okay. So we do have arrangements and we are strengthening and developing those arrangements to make sure that care homes can manage the absences that they may experience. Okay, we also had Colin's question in relation to PPE guidance where symptoms are not presented and Paula had a question there in relation to direct payments and how those are being managed. Okay, um, on direct payments, uh, uh, certainly uh, we would say that uh, mm -hmm. anyone who's in receipt of direct payments who feels that the people they have working for them delivering care require PPE, um, that that uh, should be accessed through the trust, that they are included in that offer. Um, uh, we recognise that we need to do more to strengthen the circumstances of people uh, who are in receipt of direct payments, um, uh, that they may need to have the ability to reinforce the care arrangements they have around them. So one of the pieces of guidance that I think Mark didn't mention, but I know he's working on um, uh, at the moment uh, furiously to get out, is guidance in relation to direct payments. Um, uh, and we would anticipate that in addition to addressing the issue of PPE, that will also look at providing extra financial support to those in receipt of direct payments so that they can make arrangements to ensure the continuity of, 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 of their care. Uh, in relation to asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, people, um, I don't want to stray into areas of, of um, uh, technical expertise um, uh, about the advice which is generated by people who are experts in infection control. I am not one of those people. Um, but the uh, most recent guidance offers greater flexibility to staff to assess when they feel they need to use um, uh, PPE. Uh, and so if they are concerned, uh, the new guidance really says for those people who are out in the community delivering domiciliary care, if you um, are concerned that you feel you need to use PPE, then the guidance will um, support that. Mark, do you want to add to any of those points? Yeah, just to say on um, direct payments, the um, current domiciliary care and support living guidance, which was published on the 17th of March, uh, has a, a very clear paragraph in there, just as Sean said, about um, the need for trust to um, support carers who are getting direct payments in terms of provision of PPE. Um, we have guidance on um, uh, carers coming out shortly, which again will have a have uh, a reference to uh, direct payments um, in it. Um, and then I think, as um, Sean has said, there's, there's more flexibility in the, in the current PPE guidance around um, uh, people carrying out individual risk assessments, recognising that, that COVID-19 is circulating in the community um, and therefore making a choice on the, on the PPE that they choose to use. 
Okay, so listen, that, that concludes that round on, uh, on, on, PP, on PPE. We're now going into a further round of questions. And uh, this, for this round, I would like uh, members to concentrate on the testing issue, which I know there are also many, many questions on. So I will uh, I'll just go, I'll, I'll go the same order there again. So I'll go back to the people on the phone. So can Pam, can I have your question, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of testing, obviously we have the testing strategy which has been published, which deals with short term, medium term, and long term. When does that start? In terms of when is week one? Is is the, the first bit of it? And then I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of care homes, obviously uh, care workers, the healthcare workers, including uh, staff care homes, will be included in in the testing, which is very much welcomed. Um, but in what circumstances are residents of the care homes to be tested um, and at what stage does that kick in in terms of the short, medium and long term and how, how do you marry those two scenarios together where staff may be being tested earlier and uh, actual residents being tested at a later date? Thank you, Pam. Um, I would also, focusing on, on, the, on the, known, the known situation where we have seen clusters across the world in the care sector and the vulnerability of that sector, there remains a concern about a lack of testing of those discharged from hospital into the care sector. I'd like you to give us an update if there's any, uh, how, how you're moving to address that concern, Sean. Um, I also think that it's crucial that given the potential for clusters within care settings, that residents, but also staff, are tested, and that that testing is accompanied and backed up by the very important issue of isolating, tracing the contacts, and isolating all those and any further testing that's indicated. So I'd like an update on that. Um, I will now go then to Orlea. Yes, thank you, Colin. Um, I just wanted to ask on the, the paper that was provided in the committee pack. I know when we spoke to the minister at last week's meeting, um, we were asking for the, the, the paper that's being drafted up from the department, the, the actual strategy paper for testing. I'm not sure if, if the paper that we're provided with is more of a, a briefing note for committee papers or is this the actual testing strategy that has been officially signed off? Um, from the department, so maybe just a wee bit of clarity um, on that. And then just the final thing was in and around the numbers are we tracing, um, we'll have the test centres obviously up and running now as of last week. Um, is the department um, tracking how many um, staff are being tested through those centres from the health care sector and then also from the social care sector? Thank you. Yep, thank you, Orlea. And I just draw members' attention to tab 3.1, which has the uh, DOH testing strategy included therein. And I will now go to Colin. Colin McGrath. Thank you very, you, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Chair, just two elements of it. Number one is that um, in that document, it says that COVID testing is limited to key health and social care staff. Is there any way of getting a definition of what a key a uh, member of a health and social care staff is uh, and how does that differentiate between others? Um, and then in the two different phases that are referenced, there's um, the containment phase. Um, it said that it would be a case of checking people that were unwell and those contacts that were with them. Could we get a flavour of how many contacts were actually tested? And then finally, it says that within the delay phase, it makes reference that um, it will be for those that are hospitals, um, health and social care workers. But then it also says um, about plans are being actively developed to support testing of key workers in other agencies. Could I get a flavour of how active that development is and what the other agencies are? Okay, um, go on then to Paula. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm focusing on the testing centre on the Crumlin Road. Is, is it correct um, that that is to close this week um, to move the services to the likes of the SSB Arena? Um, that testing centre are able to get the results back within 24 hours, which is my understanding compared to 72 for the SSB Arena. And also um, in that arena, um, are they being asked to test themselves 
Because to get an accurate sample, you would need them to be almost gagging and their eyes watering. That you know they need to get so far back into their throat. So I'm I'm concerned that the Crumlin Road testing facility with highly um, senior experienced staff not being closed down for expediency and the SSD arena will maybe um, not be as effective in terms of the 72 hour wait, which means that healthcare workers are not getting back in time and possibly that the samples are not going to be good enough. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it is, it is worth noting that we will want to do a, a, a deeper drill down into the testing strategy. The, the key issue that we are looking to discuss with Sean in relation to testing today is around the care homes and the huge concerns that there are, the, the potential for clusters, the potential for further spread. So I think we will, we will also be coming back to the testing strategy more fully. Um, so I'll go now to Pat and then I'll come back into the room. So Pat. Thanks, Chair. And, uh my question relates to um, contact tracing. Uh, the, when the British uh, strategy changed on the 12th of March, uh, contact tracing was stopped, or at least it was drastically scaled back. Did the same thing happen here, particularly in relation to contact tracing, uh, any positive testing in care homes or residential uh, settings? Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, I have an indication now in the room from Alex and Jerry. Yeah, um, Chair, can I come back on PPE? Um, no, not in this section, Alex. Sorry, we yeah. will come back hopefully for a general question. You can go back on that, but we have dealt fairly extensively with it. Okay, um, on P on testing. Sorry, um, they were meant to use the MOT centre in Newton Arts. And for some reason that's been stopped and they're all being sent to the Odyssey. Is there any particular reason why that's the case? And also from an email from a nurse, um, she's saying to me that when they're doing the tests that people are having to do the tests themselves. Um, and she's, um, this nurse is saying that that's not going to give true reflection of tests because people aren't experts at swabbing the back of people's throats. Okay. So um, is there any truth to that? Um, would that not be a waste of testing if that's the case? Okay, thank you. Um, Jerry and then Alan. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the strategic context paper says testing is a critical part of our pandemic response. I'd like to ask why is so little of it happening and why is there a slowness uh, of it uh, being rolled out? Uh, we heard on Tuesday in the Assembly that only 0.4% of the population have been tested. That's shockingly low, so a response uh, on that, please. And something that I've been raising for weeks, uh, we have a situation where we've got a company, Randox, that makes testing kits. Uh, they receive handouts um, from the taxpayer, but yet we still can't get access. We can't roll out testing on a wide scale, so that's very, very uh, concerning. And they add insult to injury, they're charging £120 uh, for them. And it's welcome news that healthcare workers uh, are being tested, uh, but there's still the latest figures 736 people per day uh, are being tested. That's way behind the department's own. Um, uh, strategy a target of 1,100 per day. So uh, I'd like to say, or ask rather, um, it's welcome news that healthcare workers are being tested. When is that going to be rolled out for all key workers and all frontline, including retail workers? Okay. And uh, finally, Alan. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that, that staff working in care homes and domiciliary staff are able to avail of this drive in testing. So just want to confirm that. And the other thing, if I could be told, is it correct that Northern Ireland is actually leading in terms of the UK testing averages? Okay, Sean, okay. Mark, you have, those, you have those questions, please, if you could uh, move through them yeah. as, as, uh, as, uh, as, as fully as possible. Well, I think I have to be very honest with you, Colin. These are not going to be as full an answer as, as uh, members are, are hoping for. Um, and that's because I think a lot of the questions, uh, which are, are absolutely legitimate questions, but they uh, really relate to the testing regime more than to um, social care. And I'm really 
cautious about not trying to answer those questions that would be better answered by other members of the team, either at the Department of Health or, or the Public Health Agency, um, or indeed the Health and Social Care Board. Uh, as, what as, they we apply, will do, as they apply to the care home sector or and domiciliary I'll, care shop? them as far as, I can, as far as I can as they apply to the, the, the care home sector. But what I would uh, do, as we always do, Colin, as you know, is give an undertaking to provide you with a fuller response in writing as quickly as possible where we feel we can't address the questions. Um, I'll start with the, 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 the final points about um, uh, testing. Yes, um, nursing uh, and residential home staff and domiciliary care staff can be tested. Uh, and my understanding is some have been tested. I don't have numbers at this stage. Uh, also, residents of care homes uh, have been tested and can be tested. Uh, and in terms of where Northern Ireland is in relation to the UK figures for testing, my understanding is that, yes, we are leading uh, in, in terms of the number of tests being undertaken. Um, but I think that the detail on that will we'll follow that up with you. What we have in place is an interim pro protocol that identifies priority groups for, for testing. The protocol has uh, always facilitated testing to support the assessment and the management of potential clusters of infections in care homes. Uh, the point was made that care homes um, are, are appearing as potential uh, areas where, where, where this infection uh, can be present, um, uh, and that's been the case uh, in the UK, but also in other countries. Um, PHA, Specialist Health Protection Staff, will engage with a senior member of staff in the care home. They undertake a risk assessment. Depending on the findings of the risk assessment, uh, residents and or staff may be identified as needing to be tested. Um, my understanding is, and again, we'll provide more of this with uh, more suitable expertise from, from the public health side of the house, but the, the risk assessment can be complex, taking into account a number of different factors, uh, including symptom onset, the nature of symptoms, um, uh, staff and resident movements, also the layout and design of the facility, because I think uh, the point was made about, you know, sort of the need sometimes to isolate uh, patients within uh, or residents within, within a care home. So uh, that's significant. My understanding is that it isn't always necessary to test all staff or residents, even when there is a cluster. Um, uh, uh, but that judgment is made through engagement between the care home provider and the uh, expert staff in the PHA. Uh, we are looking at the level of uh, outbreaks in, in the care home sector. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, we're, we're tracking a number of instances where either confirmed COVID or um, uh, an unconfirmed but flu-like um, uh, symptom uh, breakout is happening, and we're, we're monitoring that. What I would say is that we, and the, these are not um, verified figures, so I must put that, 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 that label on them, but what we're seeing at the moment is that we seem to be running at or a little bit below the UK average for the uh, outbreak of, of clusters in care homes at the moment, but that's a very fluid situation, um, and, and those numbers need to be revisited uh, and verified before I, I would consider them official numbers. Um, in terms of key workers and who are key Sean, staff... Sorry, uh, just to interrupt you there. Yeah. Given that we know the clusters and the potential of spread, why is testing for all staff? And, and that's, that's a, limited enough, a limited enough and a very, very important demographic. So why, what, is, what is the reason? What's, what's the evidence to say that we shouldn't be testing? Bear in mind in particular that the World Health Organization are saying we should be test, 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 isolate, trace in all cases. But in particular, where we have vulnerability and potential for spread, why are we not focusing on that? Um, I think it's accepted that we're on a trajectory of increasing the volume of testing across all settings uh, in Northern Ireland, um, and that's a recognition that this is something that it's desirable to do more of than is currently uh, happening. Um, uh, the, the particular decisions about the prioritisation of, of uh, where and when uh, we test in that ramping up, um, I am not going to... Uh, answer uh, that question purely Tom, because I, I really think it would be better for a public health expert to, to address that and um, we'll follow that up with you uh, in writing and I'm sure you as you indicated will want to have sessions that specifically look at the issue of testing. Uh, and there, likewise, it, sounds, it sounds Sean like the, the, the reason it's not happening is the availability is not there and if that's the case then the department has a huge responsibility to ramp that up at speed. I would say that my understanding is that across the UK and across 
the world, countries are ramping up um, their ability to test. Uh, I mean, I, I listened to the news this morning, as I'm sure you did, and I hear um, uh, a lot of discussion about the central government proposals to increase testing, and uh, certainly it's the ambition to uh, increase the numbers of people tested in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, but again, I'm not going to be drawn on giving you uh, technical answers about the decisions of who, when and why, when those would be better provided by a public health expert. Um, equally, the decisions around the testing centres are, are beyond um, my scope to, 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 to answer. Um, Mark, do you want to add anything on, on this issue of testing? Mm -hmm. I'll just pick up a couple of points, maybe, if that's okay. So I think there's a reference just to, um, I think, contact tracing within the home. Um, when there is an outbreak, there's a, an expert team from the public health agency that get in contact with the home, provide advice and provide guidance. And, and part of um, what they ask the home to do is to uh, trace the, um, the resident contacts of affected residents and then isolate them for, for 14 days from their last exposure to the affected resident. So there is, um, there is within homes when there when there is an outbreak, there is that um, uh, contact tracing. Uh, and and, and Mark, a, Mark, should that not also include the workers in that in the, in those settings? Because those workers are obviously going back out to their communities and their families. So surely the workers within the and I, I absolutely would support that residents would be getting tested, but the workers also, in 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 order to protect them, but also in order to try to utilise that knowledge to prevent further spread. Uh, and again, I'd, um, if I had a bit longer, I could probably search through this guidance and give you a, a really firm answer on that. But that would be something that the, the PHA infection control specialist would would advise on. I know they um, also, as part of that guidance, when there is an outbreak, they ask uh, all staff uh, and all residents to be checked twice a day for symptoms, uh, including temperature. So there is that that monitoring in place there. Uh, within within the home when there's an outbreak to 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 catch anyone who's uh, symptomatic at the at the earliest possible stage. Um, the, the only other point I was going to say in terms of the I think there's a, a question around the, the definition of key workers. We do have that. I want to make sure we're giving you the most uh, up to date uh, version of that. So I'm sure we can write and follow up and and, and set out the definition of. Um, key health and social care workers who are able to access testing. I think there's a there's a number of categories referenced, um, including um, community health and social care workers. There is then also, um, uh, I believe, a kind of broad ability for medical directors in the trust to to add uh, add in other trust staff who aren't aren't caught by the definitions um, uh, set out in, in that paper. Colin, um, yeah. as I say, I understand that the uh, responses we've given you on testing have not adequately answered the questions that you've put to us, um, uh, and, and we will come back to you with uh, information when we put those questions to colleagues. And as you yourself said, I'm sure you're going to be looking at the issue of testing again uh, in more detail and in a broader uh, 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 way. Yeah, and I think that's crucial, Sean. And I think what's what's also crucial is that that area is that that issue is acted on with haste by the department in order to maximise the, the the potential to prevent further spread. So we will we will uh, eagerly await that information, but also we would urge you to be acting at the at the same time. I want to take now a more general uh, range of questions, and I will propose this time I'll go, I'll go in reverse order. I'll go, I'll go to everybody. Because of the people on the phone, I'll go to you all. If you don't have an additional question, that's fine, but I don't want to miss someone. So I'll take it maybe in reverse order this time. So I'll go then to yourself, Pat, in terms of a more general question. Pat Sheehan. Might we have Pat at this stage? So I'll go then. Yeah, are you there, Pat? And yeah, Pat, we're, we're, we're going with a more general range of questions now for for the uh, for Sean and Mark. Is this still in relation to testing? Uh, no, it can be it can be on testing or on anything on, on a more general theme as well, Pat. Whatever. Well, I, I wanted to ask that question in relation to the ECMOs. Is this the right time to ask that? Or yeah, not? yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sean and Mark. That last week, the minister told us that there are no. ECMOs available here in the north, and that if a patient becomes uh, critically ill and needs an ECMO, they will be uh, 
flown to Newcastle uh, to be given that particular uh, uh, treatment. Is this not totally unrealistic that if someone has becomes critically ill, the chances of them being flown across the water to access this treatment is just totally uh, not going to happen? It's uh, it's unrealistic in the extreme to expect a critically ill patient to be flown across the water at this time, and so should we not be trying to access these particular machines? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pat. Yes, Sean, go ahead. Just answer question by question now, if you can, as as, as appropriate to care home settings. Okay, well, um, in relation to uh, ECMOs or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation machines, um, you're talking about a, a, a very um, uh, technical and acute centered piece of kit. Uh, it's not a, 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 a piece of equipment um, that uh, would be deployed uh, in, in a social care setting. Indeed, it's not one that's um, deployed in most acute settings. It is uh, the case that there is not um, that, that availability in the UK. This is a, a piece of organized, uh, a piece of um, machinery that's um, sort of like a heart-lung bypass machine. It's normally used uh, in, in open heart surgery. Um, uh, I would not say it is um, uh, uh, the case that someone wouldn't be flown uh, to access uh, such a machine in another part of the UK. Uh, what I would say is that decision would be taken on the basis of uh, 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 the clinical team working with that patient, um, uh, and it would be uh, one where there would have to be a clear clinical uh, 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 chance of this being um, uh, successful. Uh, but really, Pat, I appreciate the question. I will get a, a fuller answer from my medical colleagues for you, um, but that, that's not really within the realm of social care uh, to, to, to respond to. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in relation to care homes, we have heard, I have certainly heard several cases where families are concerned about conversations around do not attempt to resuscitate and uh, the, the choices in relation to that. What is the guidance in relation to care homes in relation to having those conversations around do not resuscitate orders? Okay. Um, I think that you are talking about a very sensitive issue um, and uh, I actually think it's something that all of us should think about talking to our loved ones about, not just in the context of the current pandemic. I think that uh, we should all maybe have honest discussions uh, with, with, with our loved ones about what we would like to happen in certain circumstances. Uh, long before this um, awful pandemic uh, came upon us, uh, people were faced with uh, very difficult situations where uh, a loved one uh, found themselves uh, maybe having had a traumatic accident or a sudden illness, uh, and they really wished that they'd had a conversation with them beforehand about uh, what decisions they would like in those circumstances. So I know it's difficult, um, and I know it can be frightening and it, it can be painful, but really all of us uh, should look to the ones who we love and think about how we could help them uh, in the situation where we became critically ill. Uh, now, having said that, I think that these are decisions that should be um, uh, between families. Um, there have been reports about blanket use of uh, do not resuscitate um, uh, orders, uh, where, where classes or groups of people, populations of, of people, have been um, identified as being not suitable for resuscitation. That is wrong. I have no uh, evidence of that happening in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, uh, but I, I would not support um, that approach under any circumstances. Uh, the, the, the decision, um, advanced discussions are good. Uh, the ultimate decision has to be one made uh, in partnership between the clinical team uh, and uh, family and carers. Uh, Mark, do you want to add to it, anything to that? Uh, no, I think that covers it. Okay, um, Alex? Um, yeah, it's on the same issue. Um, I actually got an email about this from a family today. Um, it's got me very concerned. Sorry, can I stop you there? Uh, apologies, but Alex is not coming through very clearly at all. 
Can you speak, try, try speaking a little louder, Alex? Can you hear me now? I, I'm it's straining to, to be honest. Just give us a second, Sean. We're going to try to get the telephone equipment a bit closer to Alex. <clears throat> okay. So if that can improve. Okay, Alex, go again, please. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Okay, um, on the same issue, um, it's an issue I, I've got an email today, this morning, um, about the very same issue as DNR's, um, and it's to do with a lady, who obviously I can't give you her name, who's currently in the Ulster Hospital, and her family have contacted me, and she was put on DNR, even though she's totally conscious. Um, she wasn't told she was being put onto that. Her family have not been contacted about that. So can you assure me that people's lives are not being decided without consultation with their loved ones? Because if that's the case, that's totally unacceptable. Because it's happened uh, in this case of this lady. To your specific case, but if you want to provide us with details of that case, uh, I will have colleagues um, uh, follow that up with you. Um, I really would just repeat the point I've already made, Alex. Um, my understanding is that uh, these are decisions. Ideally, we should all talk about these things when we're fit and well. Um, in the situation that we're in, uh, and you're presented uh, with, with uh, these very difficult choices, this should be a discussion between the clinical team uh, and family and carers. Um, as I say, we'll respond if you want to provide us with details to the specific issue you've raised. Well, indeed, but I just I need to have 100% reassurance that in these situations, families will always be consulted first. And I stand by what I've said. That's my understanding of what should happen. Um, I, I never give 100% guarantees about what does happen uh, when, when appearing before the committee um, uh, because uh, I recognise that uh, it, it, it's not within my gift to guarantee every single situation. Uh, but uh, we will address the specific issue and we'll follow up with um, uh, providing you with the actual detailed guidance um, that uh, clinical staff should be working to uh, in relation to the issue. Yeah, and I think, I think it's key. I think we will be very, very uh, keen that, nurse, that staff are well aware that those guidelines exist and that those conversations must be had yeah. in, in, with family and with, with patients um, so that there is no room for for misinterpretation and that pressure of time doesn't lead to these hugely sensitive and difficult decisions being rushed, that families are given the time to consider and discuss and participate in those discussions fully. Yep. Um, I'm going to just quickly check now back with the phone. And, and again, I want to emphasise that, that if people don't have a question, that's fine, but I don't want to miss it. Paula, do you have anything there in terms of a question? Just want to ask um, what support is coming from the trust to the care homes and nursing homes in terms of enhanced communication between the patients and their families. I'm, I'm conscious that Easter is coming up and it's a very important family time, so really just to see what, how they're facilitating that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we have to be realistic and it's not going to be um, what we would like. Uh, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, like many of you, I'm sure, I've had members of my family in care homes uh, at various times, and Christmas and Easter were always times when uh, the family would visit en masse and spend some time, and it was part of the rhythm of, of, of the day, be it Easter Sunday or Christmas Day or whatever. And that's not going to be the case this year. Uh, one of the first things that we uh, strongly urged care homes to do was to place almost draconian restrictions on people going in and out of the facilities um, uh, because uh, we recognised that the sadness that might be caused by not being able to visit and be with relatives had to be balanced against minimising the risk of infection. So it's not going to be what people would like. We have encouraged care homes to facilitate uh, contact. Um, uh, I wrote uh, uh, to um, uh, the uh, sector, um, uh, and I've spoken on this before. Please, please, please um, be flexible, be innovative. Um, people are doing that. Uh, certainly, telephones are being used, but um, I'm aware of many instances where uh, staff are bringing in their own iPads and, and what have you and facilitating conversations with family members. That's something that's happening. Um, it's something that, as we go through the development of uh, guidance and addressing 
different issues and obviously our priority has been on those things that uh, might immediately have an impact on spread and saving lives but I, I, I would uh, intend to try and uh, bring out more support and information and advice for the sector on how you can maintain uh, the well-being of your residents and be aware of the well-being of their families by facilitating contact. I think it's a really important point, Paula. Um, it's something we'll keep under review, um, but I hope you'll understand why uh, there have been other things that we, 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 we've tried to address in advance of this. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I want to, I suppose we're, we're now coming to the stage where we're getting quite close on time, so I'd just ask members to be really succinct in, in your question, if possible, and also Sean and Mark, if you can be equally succinct as well, I'd appreciate that. I, I want to get as many in as possible. So I'll quickly go then to Jerry and then Alan and then back to the phones. Yeah, just quickly, ventilators, I think it is connected to care homes as well. I mean, there's talk in the pack of shortages internationally is, is referenced, but I don't think that's the sole reason uh, we're in this problem. Uh, we've known about the pandemic, obviously, for months. Uh, we have a situation in Galway where Medtronic, a company, is making hundreds of uh, ventilators a week. So would you accept that an approach worth considering uh, is that production and supply from this company should be redirected towards here? Uh, to ensure that we have enough ventilators, especially uh, in care homes as well? Thank you. Uh, I, I will refer that question, Jerry, to um, the members of the team at the Department of Health who are dealing with ventilators, um, and we'll get a response to you about the position of ventilators. I'm not aware of ventilators being used in care home settings, um, uh, uh, but we'll come back to you with, with, with a, uh, an answer on, on your question about ventilators. Uh, just just a, a comment on Alex point there, uh, that situation. Uh, at the Ad Hoc Committee on Tuesday, I know the First Minister was very angry uh, to have that brought to our attention and said that it was a broad consensus across the executive that wouldn't be acceptable. So I think it needs to be drawn to the attention of the executive. And in light, Alan, sorry to interrupt you, but just in light of that, uh, we are seeking a briefing from the Royal College of GPs next week in relation to that issue yeah. because it is such an important issue. Absolutely. And we will be doing a fuller examination of that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Just uh, uh, to, to, to put the, maybe the PPE a little bit into context, uh, uh, quoting from our own uh, briefing paper, uh, page 26 of it says that worldwide manufacturing capacity, this is the World Health Organization, said that worldwide manufacturing capacity would need to increase by 40% to meet the current international demands. And it also goes on to say that uh, governments and health agencies across the world, including the UK, will need to find a balance between ensuring the frontline healthcare works are afforded the utmost protection to treat the public, while also rationing supplies to ensure availability over the course of the pandemic. Is it the case that it, it could become an unfortunate reality uh, that PPE uh, could, might, become, uh, might become a feature that will have to be rationed in some form? Go ahead, Sean. Okay. Um, I'll try and avoid a speculative answer. Um, and what I'll say is that currently uh, we have sufficient supply of PPE in Northern Ireland for it to be used in accordance with the guidelines that we have in place. Obviously, for us to continue to be in that position, the supply has to be replenished. Uh, that is happening. Um, we have a team who are working exclusively on making sure that the PPE supply is adequate. Uh, and uh, as we move forward, I would anticipate that uh, that supply will increasingly be both purchase of existing stock, but also um, newly manufactured stock uh, from new, new manufacturers coming online. Uh, uh, we've seen examples locally of firms uh, stepping up, um, retooling or reprovisioning their, 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 their production to start producing PPE. I believe that that is happening across the country um, uh, and uh, that that will assist us with making sure that we have the continued supply of PPE that we need. Thank you. And I'm going back onto the phone now. Is Colin there at the minute? Colin McGrath? Yes, indeed. Yeah, maybe if we could just ask for maybe a very quick response to you know the fact that the staff in the domiciliary and out the residential nursing homes are telling us then daily that they're scared, they're frightened, and they're vulnerable. What would your message be to them to allay those fears? Okay, um, I think it would be wrong to try and completely allay those fears. I think this is a very frightening situation. Uh, I think for everyone, uh, we're all considering what might happen to us and what might happen to our families. And that is frightening. I think that for those who are working directly 
in health and social care, it's particularly grimy. I think that what I would say to try and allay those fears is to say that uh, we are making sure that you have uh, the right equipment to do the job that you're stepping forward to do. We are continuously trying to deepen our understanding of what works and what works best in handling this pandemic. Uh, and that includes looking internationally for evidence and making sure that we understand how that evidence can be applied in a Northern Ireland context. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we relax, change, and are flexible in every possible way to make sure that uh, you uh, are working in the right way and the safest possible way. Uh, but really, for me, I, 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 I just, I just would, would be in awe of the uh, commitment of those staff. Uh, and I, 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 I wouldn't think it's my place to give them false reassurances. Uh, we are working our best to support them properly, but to try and minimise what they're doing would be an insult. Okay, thank you, Sean. And our Leah? Yes, um, and thank Sean for all your answers so far. I just wanted to ask quickly about last week we had spoke to the Minister around the um, the article that was done in the Guardian around the PPE, and it was obviously reporting that the internal stock checks were um, out of stock. A lot of them were, um, and I think it's my understanding that the department did respond to the article. But I just wanted to check: um, Have you seen those those stock checks yourself? Obviously, considering the issue so prominent within the car home sector, um, and is it possible for the committee um, to see the actual documents? Um, from March to April, um, around the, the how the, the the picture of the actual um, of the actual stock checks, how they sit. Okay, my understanding is that um, uh, the current stock position is good. Uh, you will have seen uh, the minister um, uh, photographed uh, in the media with um, new shipments that have arrived, um, uh, and uh, we are plugged into uh, national supply arrangements uh, in relation to the specifics about uh, the, the, the documentation um, uh, and the methodology. We'll come back to you with more information on that. But my understanding at the moment is that we've received very, very significant uh, uh, supplies in recent days and that arrangements are in place and being continuously developed to ensure continuation of the supply. Yeah, and I just, just, John, highlight, I just highlight the fact that uh, we have already the, the, we have already requested that the leaked documents have be be brought to the committee, be given to the committee. Okay. Um, so I am going then now to uh, Pam for a final Thank question. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just to follow on from Orlea there, then can, can you confirm, Sean, that there is sufficient supply of PPE with uh, each trust available and also um, frontline social workers who are carrying out home visits every week and meeting with families, obviously doing a vital work as well. Um, can you uh, ensure that um, your current arrangements to ensure that, that the social workers are uh, made safe and also that the people they're dealing with are made safe um, by the provision of PPE. Okay. Okay. Well, firstly, again, I repeat, uh, in line with the current guidance, uh, we have the PPE in stock to meet that. Obviously, as time goes on, we're using the stock, uh, and so it will have to be replenished. But at the moment, uh, we are confident that we have the PPE to meet the demands uh, that, that, that are set by the guidance. Uh, in relation to social workers, um, I think it's really important that uh, at a time when PPE is so critical that we make sure that it's used where and when it's needed. And I think for an awful lot of social work activity, uh, it's not a requirement that people use PPE. Um, I think if you're not providing direct personal care um, uh, and not uh, coming closer than uh, two metres um, proximity to someone, the current advice is that the uh, standard social distancing measures and hand washing measures are the appropriate response. We do have a situation emerging um, in, in uh, one area of social work where, where, where we are working to uh, try and develop um, some new guidelines and arrangements, and that's working in residential settings with young people who should be practising 
um, social distancing and social isolation, uh, self-isolation, and who aren't necessarily compliant uh, with that. And that's, pro that's providing quite a challenge for uh, the social workers working with those young people. We're working to try and, and produce more guidance and make sure that staff in those situations are, are, are properly equipped and that we understand the best way of doing that, while at the same time um, not compromising the, the rights of the young people. Uh, concerned. That is a challenging area for, for, for us and um, I'd be happy to return to the committee with more information on that and other issues that relate to, to, to children's services in the future. Okay, thank you Sean and Mark. I suppose just in relation to your remarks there around uh, the, the frontline work and the difficult and dangerous work and, and I think you're right not to minimise that Sean and I think that the fact that those people are carrying out that work on all of our behalfs places a huge onus on all of us to ensure they have the equipment and the support and the guidance and the training that they need. So on that note, I want to thank you both for your contributions this morning and um, we will obviously be following up some of the issues and, and you have, you have uh, agreed to send us on some further information on some of that and we'd appreciate seeing that. So I want to wish you all both well and uh, thank you for your contribution this morning. Chair, thank you for the conduct of the session. Um, uh, I, I appreciate that we weren't able to answer the questions. I mean, normally we're, we're, we're talking about uh, things that uh, we uh, are, are, are more clearly uh, an area of one person's uh, expertise, and, and we would normally uh, hope to answer questions more, more comprehensively than we, we've been able to do this morning. Um, but I hope you appreciate that we've endeavoured to be as transparent and, uh, and as fulsome in our answers as possible. Uh, and can I also conclude by wishing you and the other committee members the very best in the coming days and um, i uh, would hope that you all keep yourselves and your family safe thank you okay thank you sean and mark okay members i'm going to propose now that we take a short uh, comfort break and also that will allow us to set up our our next yeah. contribution thank you members we come back at uh, 11 25 10 minute break please thank you this is the northern ireland assembly senate chamber Pro okay members um in this section, we uh, can advise members that we have the Chief Executive of the Southern Trust is here today via telephone to brief the committee on the Trust's response to the current situation. So can I now welcome Mr Shane Devlin, Chief Executive of the Southern Health and Social Care Trust. Good morning, Shane. Good morning, Colin. And Shane, could I ask you to go ahead and brief the committee, please, on your preparations? I certainly can. Thank you, Colm, and, and thank you, Committee, for the opportunity to brief you. Um, it is a real shame, actually, that the first appearance of the Chief Executive of the Southern Trust to the new Assembly Committee is unfortunately by telephone, given the current situation, but I really am grateful for the opportunity to have to brief you fully on, on what we are doing with regards to COVID-19. Um, obviously, as you said, Colm, I'm more than happy to take questions. Maybe I take five to six minutes just to explain where we are. Um, and then obviously any questions that you have, I will answer. If there are any that are outside of my technical knowledge, clearly we will take those questions away with us um, and get your response very quickly. I hope I'm able to answer most, if not all of your, what you're asked, but I certainly will take them away and try to answer them for you. Um, so just to, to begin with, I think it is really important from my perspective as Chief Executive just to pay a huge thanks to all of the staff in the Southern Trust um, we are in extraordinary times, and over the last three weeks, uh, we have transformed services in preparation for COVID-19, um, and that's managerially, uh, clinically, uh, a complete range of staff across, across the trust. And the commitment and the innovation, actually, has been truly amazing. And I am confident we are in a strong position moving forward. That, of course, doesn't mean that uh, we know what is coming over the hill. There is modeling, and clearly we are, we are looking closely at that modeling, and I believe we're in a strong position. But obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, and, and therefore I, I cannot be 100% confident that everything that is thrown at us, we're able to meet. I'd like to raise with you a few issues that I know clearly are hot topics and explain where we are in, in, in this. The first one is with regards to PPE, um, and quite clearly I know that for a number of staff this may remain uh, a concern. Um, and what I would say underpinning our approach in the Southern Trust has been the regional guidance, which is the PPE guidance from Public Health England, which we have all, we have all ad ad adopted. 
But also what is really important for us is that our staff have to not only be safe, but they have to feel safe. And that has been underpinning what we've been trying to do for the last couple of weeks. So we have taken that guidance. Um, we are, are using that guidance to the letter of that guidance. Um, we have adjusted very clearly our logistics processes. That means we have stock flowing from our central stores to our local areas ward, and that includes our 58 independent care homes. That includes our domiciliary care as well. And what we have done is, based on that guidance, allocated people the appropriate PPE. It is important to stress that our staff are already trained in infection control and therefore already are aware of the, the, the clear requirements for infection control. What this is doing is providing further training and the appropriate PPE for their job. We've also developed new supporting training materials online, which we're able to text to our employees. They can click on the link and they get back into the training material. And very clearly what we have done is reorganize our logistics process internally. So for example, our dom care workers get a delivery on a Tuesday and a Friday through to the dom care centers. And then obviously then we distribute that out in accordance with the guidance to the appropriate people and the appropriate level. So that for us has been a really um, difficult process because it has been a process we've had to stand up very, very quickly. Um, and clearly we want it to be right for 100% of the time, but I still suspect that occasionally we will get members of our team somewhere who either don't have the care, the PPE they think they need, and or maybe are confused on how to use it. And as a result of that, we've also set up single points of contact and any member of staff can speak to their manager and they should if they're confused with PPE, but also we have a single point of contact and 24 hour access to PPE for our staff who can ring that number for emergency delivery. That's the first element of PPE we have established. The second big area that I think is very important is about staff testing. The Southern Trust testing capacity um, for both staff and patients is 120 tests per day. Now, what we clearly will do as the testing strategy develops across health and social care and the, poly and the overarching strategy, I know that other testing will become available to my staff and my population, whether that be through centers such as the SSE Arena Center or other things, but at the moment, we have 120 test capacity per day. Yesterday, for example, we used 118 of those 120, roughly broken down 60-40 between staff and patients, because obviously there's criteria and the most in, single most important person to be tested at the moment in the criteria is obviously critical care patients. So we work through that criteria, um, and as I say, yes, they were 118 out of the 120 slots filled. Um, and obviously what that allows us to do is get staff back to work, but it also allows us to have the correct care plan for our patients. The third big element, and then just to brief the committee on, is obviously we have established our COVID focus on Craig Avon Area Hospital. That, re that was obviously required us to shift our patient flows out of our other hospital settings, create a new emergency department uh, function in Craig Avon. And as a result now, as we speak today, we have 57 COVID positive patients as inpatients in Craig Avon. We have nine patients currently being cared for in ICU. And we also have 33 patients awaiting their test results with suspected COVID. So although those numbers are large for a hospital such as ourselves, so that's 57, 33, and nine, um, we have plans for this. We've mapped out all of our bed capacity into COVID and non-COVID beds, and we have looked at how we will surge both from intensive care and non-intensive care, and we have the plans in place to deal with the numbers in line with the project projections as per the modeling. I would say, say that admissions have remained quite steady so far, so obviously there would be concerns based on evidence from around the world that steady isn't really quite what's been happening elsewhere. Um, clearly, it has remained steady. Um, to put a little bit more context around that, within our hospital environment since the beginning 
of the um, of the of the surge. We have had 16 deaths, and it's important that you're aware of that. And in total, there's been lots of talk about ventilators. The Craig Avon Area Hospital has 45 ventilators. Our ICU capacity has increased dramatically, um, but we would still imagine our ICU capacity would top out at about 30 people. Um, and therefore, from a ventilator perspective, we are planning to deal with what we think is going to come through the door. And then we have had a range of other service changes. I won't go in detail. We've changed our pediatric model. We've changed our mental health assessment model at the front door. Um, we have introduced massive amounts of home working for non-frontline non staff. We have added to our hospital of home capacity. So again, massive changes. And I suppose then just the final thing to sum up, we've also created a health village in Craig Avon, which is basically where our main COVID center is, which is a big tented village, which allows staff to have free food. It allows staff for psychological support. It allows staff to access changing facilities and showers, et cetera. Because clearly one of the key challenges on this is managing to keep our staff from um, burning out in what is a traumatic uh, management environment. I mean, at the end of the day, we're dealing with very, very sick patients. So we've created that environment as well, and also the provision of hotels for staff should they need that, etc. So I suppose in summary, Colin, that's where we are. We've put an awful lot in the last three weeks to get ourselves ready. I cannot thank our staff enough for the amount of work that has gone on in both the preparation and planning, but also now in the dealing with the patients. Uh, it, it is a bit like building the plane and flying the plane at the same time, um, and that is not an easy place to be, and I have total and utter thanks to my staff who have supported the whole organization and supported our community to get us to the place that we're at at the moment. Okay. Is that, it, is that you, Shane, there? Yes, yeah, so hopefully, Colin, that gives you an understanding of, of, of where we are. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Thank you, Colin. Okay, thank you for that, and I suppose uh, I would like to uh, endorse your, your remarks in terms of frontline staff, and um, I think we all understand that staff are working in the absolute most difficult and in some ways unimaginable circumstances, and that uh, they're doing that admirably, courageously, diligently, and effectively. Um, and in relation to that, and in relation to support for staff, I would like to ask you, what, what written guidance has been supplied to staff on what they can expect in the days and weeks ahead in relation to PPE? In the relation to PPE, so we have a number of elements of both written and also video and also other media, because as you can appreciate, um, we have um, decided to take the guidance and to try to simplify that in the way that we're deploying it. We've made areas and or services red, amber and green. So instead of having tables and tables and tables of if you're this person you have that or this person you have that, we've built it up so everyone knows either I'm in red, which it tends to be intensive care and or emergency department and others, amber, which are the areas of known COVID patients and then green are the non-COVID areas. So breaking up our, our PPE message into those three areas and then turning those messages into videos so people can read and watch the video and understand what needs to be done. Major posters across all of our service as well as then clear guidance email through our global emails. And we also have a running podcast which allows people to log onto the podcast and understand about PPE as well. So we've, we've taken the guidance, we've not, we've not moved away from that guidance, we've taken that as, as the basis of the truth, but made it slightly more simple by turning things into red, amber and green. And therefore people know which one of those groups they're in, and therefore they know if they're in amber, they need to have some kind of fluid resistant uh, surgical mask, they know they need aprons, they know they need gloves, whereas actually if you're in the red, you know you need a respirator mask and a visor, and full gowns, et cetera. So we, that's how we best communicated that, because it could become very complicated. You know, If I am person X in place Y, what should I use? So we've made it very simple. It's a red, amber, green model, and that way staff know everyone in red is like this, everyone in amber is like this, and everyone in green is like this. Okay, thank you. And uh, I just want to refer you now to the surge plan document that came out, and there was a line within that that referred to 
uh, in relation to hospital discharges that, that there would be indicated our expectations that requirements around a range of reviews and assessments and regulatory standards will be interpreted flexibly. So I want to ask you what exactly is meant by interpreted flexibly and what the implications of that might be for patients requiring social care. Um, and I suppose that, that obviously impacts the care homes. So what, what additional guidance is being provided to care homes to allow them to manage those patients? And also, if you could touch upon, we've, we've talked this morning a good deal about care homes in relation to the adult sector and, 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 and the particular vulnerability, but also in relation to children's homes where there are maybe particular challenges for staff in dealing with children in some of our children's settings. Can you give us some indication as to the impact of that on that sector? Okay, if I could take your first point first with regards to discharge, we still have our full team working um, in terms of social work team working to support people discharged. That full team is, is a critical team and it is still working. We're also working with our own acute care at home. We're doubling the resource of that. I have doubled the resource of that. And we're also linking in with our care homes. They have a single point of contact through our care home, through our older person's directorate, and working with them to help them understand. So although the guidance is about uh, flexibility, um, we're enhancing our support here because we need to help people flow out of our hospital back to the appropriate care home environment. Now, I must say, Con, that is not an easy thing to do at the moment because many of our 58 care homes are themselves concerned and scared and need to understand what needs to be done. But this is an area we have focused very heavily on because we cannot have people remaining in hospital who do not need to be in hospital. Um, and therefore, we have had a team working on that to help people flow out of the hospital. And our social work and our social care team is as big and as focused as it is, ever has been to make sure that happens. With regards to children's, um, what we have done, our children's director um, has looked at the roles that need to be carried out in children's home and has worked with his team to understand what the PPE requirements are and then making sure that they have the appropriate PPE. And, and, and I'm meeting with my team, as you can imagine, on a very regular basis, but formally every day, but a very regular basis via video conference. And these are the key things that we are looking at. So how has his team got the right PPE? Because you are correct. In children's homes, um, it isn't personal care, but there are absolutely times when a, a member of staff can feel vulnerable and could be vulnerable as a result of the behaviour of, of a child. So every single area has been looked at and every single area is in the red, amber, green. And again, our children's homes are amber because it is important that in, well, many of them, because of the situation that a care uh, giver may find themselves in. So we have looked at it, we've assessed it, and obviously then individually we are providing the appropriate PPE to those staff. Okay, thank you. And I'm now going to come to members, and we have, we have a, a, a reasonably short time, so I'd ask members all to keep your question, uh, 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 your key question, single question, keep it fairly succinct if possible. I will go to the, to the members who are participating by phone, as, as I did in the first section. So I'll go then. Um, do we have Pam Cameron there, Deputy Chair? Pam, are you there? We do. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Shane, for um, your presentation today. And just to say at the outset, thank you. Um, thank you to all your staff and people involved in, in taking care so well of us as a, a society. And we look forward to actually praising you, clapping uh, for our carers and our NHS staff this evening at 8 o'clock. Um, on... Just on the back of the PPE issue, um, are you content, Shane, that you have absolutely what you need in terms of PPE supply um, right now? Obviously, it's hard to predict what you need going into future days, but do you, are you content that you have exactly what you need right now? And are you content with the quality of that PPE? And I'm thinking in terms of your um, traffic light system and your RED, so your PPE for... ICU nurses, for instance, who have incredibly difficult jobs, and uh, I'm hearing uh, about PPE, which is hard work, not breathable, um, very difficult to spend uh, full days and full nights in. And do you have the appropriate PPE, and is it of the best quality that you would want for those members of staff in particular? Certainly, thank you, Pam. What I can say in terms of do we have what we need, at this moment in time, we have what we need, and we have a system to deliver that to the care place. 
you are correct in the sense that I don't know. I, I've got a modeling, and, I, and therefore I can, can predict, but you are correct. Um, moving forward, um, we need to understand in great detail how much PPE every care environment is using on a daily basis to be able to feed in, to really be certain that we have enough for the whole of the pandemic and the surge. So at the moment, yes, um, we still are working through because as you can appreciate, as we've introduced in line with guidance, new PPE approaches, we don't know whether that's going to mean that we're going to use 10,000 um, surgical masks a day or 50,000 surgical masks a day or maybe even more. So, so that's part of the learning, the early learning to, to give me assurance as we work our way through. But at the moment, I am content I have what I need to deliver. With regard to the intensive care, you are correct. The quali first of all, the qual I have no issue with the quality of the product that we have. We've used uh, procurement logistics service, uh, and, and that, that the quality isn't an issue. I would, however, concur with you, our staff having to wear such equipment um, for the period of time when they're working, particularly intensive care and emergency medicine, um, that is exceptionally difficult because they are warm and they are hot. Uh, a respirator mask um, is something which has no break between the mask and the face, and therefore that is obviously uncomfortable and can cause um, dermatological issues in terms of potentially across the, the, the nose, the bridge of the nose, etc. So that's what we're doing by creating up the tented village. Well, that allows people at a, at, a, at a regular basis to step away from the ward, don their PP equipment, so take it off, go to the tented village, have food, have some form of, of, of uh, hydration. There are psychological counselors there if they want to talk to them to help them, as well as we've had the psychology staff working with those teams as well, and then go back into the care environment having put on PPE again. Because the point you make is very correct, and that's what I'm learning from my critical care staff, is this is not easy uh, equipment to work in. But unfortunately, in the current climate, it is the right equipment to work in. And therefore, we have to find ways to help people down time and be able to get out of that environment and then go back into that environment. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Thank you for that, Shane. And just to just finish with a, another quick query with you, and that's also around ICU and what help you as a trust can give to those units and to that staff here under such incredible pressure. And it's been suggested to me that uh, a kind of a housekeeper or um, porter type person, uh, an additional member of staff, could actually be present in that environment to ensure that um, basic stock levels of equipment and meds and, uh, are made available to those um, ITU nurses to in order them to uh, get on with the highly professional job that they're doing and not have to be emptying bins and refilling stocks, which somebody else could do uh, and do well for them. Yeah, and, and one thing I would say, we started off not having that model. Uh, we had we, we the only people in the red were those who needed in the red as caregiving. I think the learning from the first couple of days is that we are now exploring what the potential role of, of other staff, maybe portering staff, as you suggested, could be in those environments. So we are exploring that. Thank you. Okay, um, or Leah? Do we have our Leah Flynn? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks, Shane. I just wanted to ask, we had heard from Kathy Jack last week in relation to the Belfast Trust um, that they had a, a figure of around 2,000 staff who were isolating, like 1,200 of those were isolating due to family members showing symptoms and not necessarily the, the, the health and social care worker themselves. So I just wanted to ask, do you have um, figures for the Southern Trust? And obviously, with the new testing centres that are in place now, how soon would you expect, um, hopefully, a, a large proportion of those staff to return to work? Yeah, uh, we are tracking that number every day. So today, we have 838 staff who are self-isolating. And on top of that, we have 52 staff who are actually have caring responsibilities and therefore are out of work because they're caring for somebody who is either isolating or, or obviously unwell. Now, we are smaller than the Belfast Trust, so it's important to note that. The Belfast Trust is about 22,000 employees. I have 12,000 employees. So we are smaller, so that number is always going to be smaller. In terms of then um, every day, um, we have tested so far, as of yesterday evening, a total of 464 staff. 
Um, we would hope to be able to ramp that up further, which would enable some, not all of those people, it must be said, because some of those people obviously are sick who need to be at home. Some of them are shielding in line with the shielding letter. So just because we have 838 at home doesn't mean we would get all 838 back home again. But we are hoping if we are able to do 120 start 120 tests a day, but also avail of the SSE arena and potentially look to other sites that could help us in that space, then I would be confident over the next week we can really get to into that further number. But I would stress not all 838 would return to work post-test. There are, there are many other reasons that they would be there, as I say, caring. They might be shielding themselves. They might be supporting someone who's shielding. And they may also be sim um, symptomatic and very ill. So it's not as if all 838 would suddenly be home if they were tested. OK. Um, do we have Colin McGrath? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Chair, and Shane, thank you to the team and, and the staff right throughout the southern area. Um, I wanted just to focus on, um, you mentioned about the reconfiguration of services across the trust area, and I just wanted to know if you could, what assurances you could give to the people of Newry uh, and the surrounding area that services will be returned back again once we pass, uh, which we will, uh, and get through this pandemic. And other trusts have talked about um, centralising their ventilators into that, that specific hospital, which in, in your instance would be Craig Avon. Are, are there any um, ventilators remaining uh, in Daisy Hills? Should anybody that's been treated there uh, for other health reasons require ventilation? And just finally, you mentioned about the traffic light system. C can you assure me that at no time the traffic light system within the Southern Trust has changed according to the, the availability of PPE? Okay, certainly. I, if I can address that one first, and then I'll go back up. I can absolutely assure you that our traffic light system is not dependent on availability. It's dependent on the clinical evidence and the need. Now, what we might have, for example, and I am aware a couple of nights ago, uh, eye protection. Uh, so one of the things that's in the red zone is that people should wear eye protection, that is goggles, face visor, or uh, other, other form of eye protection. It was the case that when stocks of eye protection were slightly lower, people were being asked to uh, clean, which is perfectly acceptable and, and in line with guidance to clean and reuse um, uh, that particular eye visor. But I can absolutely assure you it is not guided by stock. It is guided by clinical evidence and need. What I would then state about the other areas in terms of the ventilators, we still um, have a high dependency unit in Daisy Hill and obviously therefore if patients Non-COVID patients require some form of uh, high dependency, high care. We have staff and services there. But what I would stress is that if someone is COVID positive, they are transferred to Craig Avenue Area Hospital promptly, therefore to reduce the risk of having those kind of issues appear. And your first comment about the assurance of, of putting everything back in place, we have spent a lot of time over the last three years on the Daisy Hill Pathfinder. We have done a lot of work in terms of analyzing our population need and developing our services to meet that need. The Pathfinder clearly stated the model of care we needed, which was investment in emergency department, investment in medicine, and obviously in investment in high dependency unit in Daisy Hill. And I will return back to that because actually the population of Newry needs that in normal times, the evidence is clear. The volumes of people that transfer through Daisy Hill need those services. And I look forward to the day at the end of this process when I can return both those services back to Daisy Hill. Okay, and just sure that that's a very welcome assurance and, and I thank Shane for that. But I didn't just quite get the, if there was the answer to the ventilator question. Are there currently any ventilators in um, Daisy Hill for people that would be non-COVID that might require it? I, I will check that for you. We have a high dependency unit which is functioning, so I'm assuming we would, but please don't take that word from me. I will check that and I can come back through the committee with that exact number. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, I'll now come to Paula and can I remain members? We have agreed to, to ask one question each. Paula? Um, thank you. And thank you, Shane, um, for coming this morning. Um, I just wanted to follow on from the last question there. I just wanted to see if you could give us your assessment of the impact of the temporary closure of Daisy Hill Emergency Department and what impact that's had on the other ones that are covering and the out of hours, for example. Thank you. Certainly. Um, what has happened, uh, and it's not just the Southern Trust, inevitably, but what has happened across all Northern Ireland, but I'll speak about the Southern Trust, is demand has quite reduced 
Okay, so what that has meant is that the normal flows to the emergency departments, that's both our, our Daisy Hill and also Craig Avon, and obviously now all coming through Craig Avon, is low. Now, I think that's probably on the basis of a number of things, and this is me speculating. Firstly, I think the family home situation is very different at the moment. There are lots of people who are isolating and caring for their loved ones in their own home, and that actually is changing the profile of demand. With fewer people out in the road, and therefore the opportunity to be involved in trauma or a car accident is also lower. Um, but also, I think people are genuinely con concerned and scared. They don't wish to come to hospital unless they really feel they need to. And therefore, what has happened at the moment is that the numbers of people traveling through our, our normal system have quite reduced. And as a result, that has not put huge pressure on Craig Allen Area Hospital non-COVID ED. Okay, so that's important that it has not caused huge pressure. I fully expect uh, whenever we come out of the pandemic that that demand will grow again because I think that demand is being suppressed by those areas that I've just talked about. So hopefully that gives you an understanding of, of what is happening with our emergency department at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Pat Sheehan then. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thanks for that, Shane. Um, we're being told the testing is to be ramped up, and, and that's welcome. However, international best practice would show that contact tracing is equally important. So could you tell the committee what level of contact tracing is taking place in your trust area? And do you feel that some of your patients uh, in your trust area with COVID-19 are disadvantaged by virtue of not having access to ECMOs? Uh, what I would stress, first of all, Pat, is that contact tracing is a public health agency discussion with all due respect, and therefore it isn't something that I would comment on. Uh, it's a position we are in the pandemic at the moment, and we will follow the appropriate governmental guidance, uh, as is stated, and therefore it's not as a chief executive uh, my role or choice to become involved in contact tracing. If that becomes the, the policy direction, Clearly, I would support that if, it had, if that was the policy direction. But I would stress it is not something the trusts are, in, are involved in. And what in is the policy direction at the minute, Shin? Well, the uh, policy direction is clear. Contact tracing is not part of the policy direction in the phase of the pandemic that we're in. But I would again refer back to the PHA and public health generally. Um, that, is, that is my understanding. And I would stress it's not an area that trusts or trust chief executives are, are involved in. <laughs> Um, in, terms of, in terms of the ECMO, um, my understanding is there are very, very few uh, services anywhere in the United Kingdom. I, I will prove to be wrong there, but I, I think it could be single figures. Um, that is a service that if we have ever had to use in the past, we would fly people, I believe it's to Newcastle, if I remember correctly. Um, and if that were the case, we would do so. It is not something that we have had to do, and it is not something my clinicians have indicated to me they expect to do. But I am not a, I'm not a respiratory clinician, I'm not an intensive care clinician, and therefore I will take my lead from them. But that is no different from any other normal time that we're in. There is one service that we would access, and that's Newcastle County Durham, I believe. Shane, just on that point, given that there has now been a memorandum of understanding signed between the, the CMOs North and South, and given I believe that there are ECMO machines available in the South, would it not make much more sense from a family point of view and from a patient point of view that we explore potential access, should it be needed, to ECMO North-South? Um, from a chief executive perspective, I would say that we so rarely use this. It hasn't been on my agenda, but what I would stress is that's something the committee feel is important. I would suggest that it is the CMO and the Department and Public Health would have that conversation, not me as a provider of care, Colin. Okay, okay and we, we'll, we'll follow that up. We are following that up in any case. Um, Alex, then I have an indication from Alex. Yeah, then Jerry. Just a quick question. Um, I see that you've got nine in intensive care. Um, how, are you, how are you off for ventilators and that sort of thing? We have a total of 45 ventilators in Craig Avon. We currently have nine patients in ICU, and I, I actually don't know whether all of those are ventilated. I don't have that number in front of me, but that gives you an understanding. We have 45 ventilators. We currently have nine who are in ICU. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, like a lot of your, like your trust, like a lot of trusts, has a lot of agency workers uh, on the front line. Um, will your trust be rewarding them and thanking them by giving them a permanent job um, after this crisis, especially the people who were uh, employed um, previously? Um, first, first and foremost, I would say that, that our agency workers are treated in the same way as any of our employees, in a sense that they are valued members of staff. Um, in terms of, uh, and therefore have access to PPE training uh, and all the facilities I described before, in terms of making them full-time employees, um, at the moment I, c I couldn't have an understanding or commitment to that, just simply because it isn't something that, that, that I have personally been involved in. What I would say is that we always want to try to make as many of our pay temporary agency employees permanent. Um, and we have attempted to do that if that's what they want, and we have attempted to do that. But I will take that point on board, explore with my director of HR as to post-event what opportunity there would be to bring those kind of individuals onto permanent contracts. But we attempt to do that anyway, because that is a better way to support our trust, support our patients, and in support the employee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shane, a quick question, just in relation to the shielding letters, we've we've picked up some concern. Have the shielding letters gone out at this stage? The shielding letters have been issued via individuals' GPs, and my understanding is that they have, because certainly we have employees that have received shielding letters, um, and I have actually have a personal friends who have received a shielding letter. So my understanding, it was maybe probably about nine or ten days ago when the decision was taken, and my understanding through GPs, they have been sent. It's not something trusts obviously were involved in sending, so I, 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 you would have to check with primary care and the board, but that is certainly my understanding, Colin. Okay, well, the committee has been instrumental in terms of uh, working with the motor neuron disease in terms of getting that, that sector added to that list, but I don't think that they have had the letter, so could you just check in terms of your own trust following this meeting what the situation is with that sector? I certainly can do, Colm, and I, what I will do is make contact through the Health and Social Care Board to, through to Primary Care to see whether that has been the case. Thank you, and I have an indication from Alan as well. Uh, just a very quick question uh, to Shane. Uh, it's indicated that nine of the ICU uh, beds are deployed at the moment out of a total of 45. Um, that can I confirm he does have the staff available uh, to fully uh, function the, the 45 uh, ventilated beds should they be required and uh, is that staff what are that staff being deployed doing at the moment okay what I would stress to you is we do not have 45 ICU beds we have available 45 uh, uh, ventilators and let me explain what I mean by that um, what we are intending to do is expand our ICU capacity in line with clinical guidance so that our doctors and our nurses in ICU can then take on with the support of other staff and many times our anaesthetists can support a greater number of patients. I would not envisage, in fact I would suggest not at all, we would ever get to 45. I think what we are exploring is what is the maximum number that our staff, supported by their nieces' colleagues, could safely manage. And that is a number that we think is close to 30, not 45. And therefore, simply having ventilators doesn't mean that we would attempt to run 45 ICU beds. That would not be safe based on my senior clinician's views. And I suspect that we would actually, when we got into the mid-20s to the high-20s, that would be the point where we would be looking to expand other capacity and patients possibly into the Nightingale Hospital, etc. So that's really the plan. Um, we could not safely manage, and nor would we attempt, 45 ICU patients on Craig Alvin with the staff that we have. It would not be the appropriate thing to do. Okay, thank you, Shane. Just one final point I want to, to see. What reassurance can you give the committee that people who are picking up on a cure at home now in, in this current situation where domiciliary care is stretched and people are picking up, or people maybe who had direct payments in place, can you assure people that those arrangements which were in place when this emergency situation has <coughs> been dealt with, that those will go back to where they were and the families will not be uh, disadvantaged as a result longer term? Yeah, I, I absolutely can give you that 
guarantee column. What we're looking at, as you, as you well know, the care assessment process identifies a care need and then we address that care need. And that is irrespective of whether we're in a pandemic or not. If a person has an identified need, we have the responsibility and the accountability to deliver the care for that need. And that doesn't change. That really doesn't change. It still is, if someone's got a need, our job is to meet that need. Okay, thank you, Shane. And on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you for your time and your, your answers there this morning, and to wish you, your, your leadership team, and your frontline staff right throughout the, right the organisation all the very best in the weeks ahead, and that to uh, assure you that uh, you will have our support and uh, that, that it, it's a vital time and that we really appreciate the work that everyone in health and social care, both in acute and in the community, are doing at this time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. And I wish the committee uh, safety as well. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. Okay. Very well then. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, members. Okay, members. That concludes that that section. So um, we're now turning to correspondence. And can I refer members to correspondence at tab four of the pack and to the table papers and the correspondence memo at tab four point one. So, in relation to those items of correspondence, are members content with the actions as, notice, as noted in the correspondence memo? Yes, Jay. Yeah, Chair. Sure. Obviously, it's in relation to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, We're coming on to that. Yep. I just want to deal with those items specifically, and then I'm coming on Thanks. next to the Human Rights Commission. So, Alan, yes. Yeah, well, Chair. I, I was rather disappointed that uh, there was comments made by a committee member on social media. Uh, about this committee, more or less uh, getting into holiday mode, um, and that uh, obviously uh, triggered a lot of the correspondence that, uh, that we got. And uh, I know that when the, the date of the next meeting was uh, raised, the last week's meeting, there was no, nobody raised any concerns about it. And, uh, but obviously all the committee members are, we all realize that we are on standby. It is uh, a crisis situation. Um, and I think that uh, the fact that uh, we have a full attendance this morning, I think, is evidence of the fact of the commitment of all members of this committee to ensure that we continue to do our work uh, right over what would be a holiday period. Okay. Um, can, in, in relation to the correspondence tab at 4.1, are members content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Great. Yeah. Members on phone content? Okay. And then, yeah, and then yeah. thank you. And then moving on, can I draw members' attention to the letter from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission at tab 4.8 in your table papers? Um, are members content to forward this to the department and the executive office for comment? And I want to say that I have myself this morning picked up where there's serious concerns around different thrusts being uh, advised not to provide services and I think it's actually it's vital this this is a legal requirement and trust should be trust should be providing the services I think it's crucial that women are provided with services and, and health services in a compassionate way and in a way which recognizes the additional difficulties that that have arisen here in terms of the COVID-19 and in terms of potentially the need for telemedicine so what are members views on that on this subject Chair. Yeah, I have an indication from Jerry, and then I have Pam, I think, there, was it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, so I'll, I'll take those two and then I'll, I'll move on to other members. Um, yeah, obviously, Chair, sure this was raised last week, and, and since that, nothing has happened in terms of making provision available. We've learned about two women who have attempted uh, to take their life because they got uh, denied access to abortion uh, and limiting access to abortion or forcing women to travel uh, according to CEDAW. Um, amounts is tantamount to torture. So I want to propose it's in the power of the health minister um, to allow women to get access to telemedicine at this time. It's not required for the executive to sign off on anything. So I want to propose. I understand members may have different uh, views on this, but I want to propose that the committee writes to the health minister and encourages, implores him to release uh, the availability of telemedicine for women who uh, look on access who need access to abortion services. Okay, uh, Pam. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, obviously, this is a cross-cutting issue, and it will require discussion and agreement of the entire executive. We know that the Attorney General has raised concerns about the implementation of the framework, uh, which needs to be addressed. And it, it, I think he has every right to make representations on uh, this issue. 
So uh, my awareness is the, the health minister, has, he will be bringing forward a paper to the executive and that will be discussed. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I, I believe, you know, this abortion regime is a really retrograde step for Northern Ireland society at a time when all our priority is actually on saving lives. And, and it's, of course, it's a complex issue, um, but I think it has to be considered um, absolutely by locally devolved executive ministers. So I have no issue with it being sent to the executive office for uh, for them to look at it, but I certainly would not be in support of Jerry's proposal. Okay. Chair? Yes, is that Paula? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would support um, Jerry in this. I think that it's shameful that we have got to this stage. The women in Northern Ireland have fought hard for this, and we're, we're in, a, in a very difficult position, especially with the COVID-19 um, closed down. I would put on record my thanks to BPAS, who this morning have launched um, a telemedicine service for women in Northern Ireland. They can no longer stand by and allow women to face crisis pregnancies. So I just want to put on record my thanks to them for stepping up when others wouldn't. Thank you. Any other views? Chair. Yeah, who is this? Yes. Pam, if, if I could just come back in on, um, just to say, I, I would like to get some clarity from the department that, um, I mean, certainly as far as I'm aware, that um, it, women have always been um, able to access medical terminations in the instance where their life um, is in danger or uh, indeed their mental health is in grave danger. So I would like to get some clarity uh, around that, that that has never changed and that um, the, the medical attention they require has always been there and will remain to be there despite these discussions. Okay. Um, any other members on the phone who wish to contribute to this? Okay, not hearing any other. Um, so the, the, the first part of the question is, are members content to forward this to the Department and the Executive Office for comment? And then there's a proposal from Jerry that we uh, ask right, right to the, the Health Minister and urge him to put services in place for women. So, agreed. No, not agreed, Chair. Not agreed. Okay. Okay, I don't Chair, think... Chair, I agree, I agree that, we, that we raise the issue with the Department uh, for comment and that it goes to the Executive, but not, I do not support Jerry's proposal. Okay. So, Members, I think we are going to need to go to a vote in relation to the, the proposal. I think we are content to send to the Executive, but further to that, to write into the Minister, um, I don't think we have, we have obviously different views being expressed, so I think we will need to move to a vote. So what I propose is that I will go to each of the members um, in turn and ask them to vote in terms of, and we are voting on the issue of writing to the Health Minister and urging to put services in place, and I'm going to ask for your vote in relation to yes or no on that. Uh, just to clarify, Chair, we have agreed as a committee that we would contact the Executive. Yes. That's, that's the decision of the committee, and that's agreed. But we also have a further proposal that yes, we Yes, I understand that, that, but there is yes. a, already an agreement on the table that we write to the executive. Just to put everything in the context, we've already taken that decision to write to the executive about the issue. The Human Rights Commission have asked us to forward their letter, and we have agreed that we, that we are doing that. Right. Okay. There is also a proposal that we write to the minister and ask him to, to uh, address the issue. And that's the, that's sure. the clear slide or something. Yes, go ahead. Uh, there's no need, the health minister has sole responsibility to act uh, in, in regards to making these guidelines and services available. So just to clarify that, I doubt, uh, are we aware of that? I mean, the if, the question was asked uh, at the ad hoc committee on Tuesday, and the answer was given that the attorney general had raised certain legal issues. Now I'm not aware of what they are because I'm not privy to even at that meeting. Neither are any of us in this room, uh, but. Uh, it, it's, I suppose it's easy to say that the, uh, the health minister can sort of wave the wand uh, uh, and uh, uh, facilitate this, but we're not privy to what pressure may have been put on him behind the scenes, either uh, from a legal perspective or from a collective uh, uh, view of the executive. 
and that's why I think it's important uh, that we, you know, we find out what the executive thinking of it is and what the legal situation is uh, from the executive perspective uh, before we would write to an individual minister about this. I would certainly like more clarity uh, before I could support uh, uh, contacting directly the health minister. I don't know what pressure he's under about it. Yeah, that... Sure, can I come in, please? Yes, go ahead, Orlea. Orlea. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, because all this is following on from, we did raise the issue directly with the Minister at last week's committee meeting. Um, and, you know, obviously there's an urgency around this situation, as Jerry had mentioned there and Paula had mentioned last week. I mean, there is women, there's cases already where women are contemplating taking their own lives. So to follow on from what was raised with the Minister directly last week, um, I, I would like to propose that the committee write to the department asking that the services are immediately provided um, to women in line with current legal entitlements. So that, that would be what I'm proposing. Okay. Um, and I think that, yeah. Uh, any other views before we move to a vote? Yes, uh, Colin, can I come in? Yes, go ahead, Pat. Not here. Could I propose that the committee write to the department asking that services are immediately provided to women in line with their legal entitlements? Is that that already? That's, that's, well, that's, that's basically a, a composite proposal that we, that we write to the department. We write to the minister asking them to put in place the services based on the legislation that has been passed. <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Okay. Yes. Okay. Chair. Yes, Pam. Chair. Pam here. Chair, just before you take the vote, can you uh, read out specifically what the wording is of the proposal? Okay. Um, that the committee write to the Minister of Health and urge him to put in place services, abortion services, as have been legislated for. Okay. Okay. So we're going now. I'll go to. I'll go to all the members in turn. I'll go with myself, and I will vote yes. Pam, your vote. Uh, my vote is no, Chair. Okay, Paula. Yes. Colin. It's Colin McGrath there. No answer from Colin. We'll come back and check before before concluding. Um, Jerry Carroll? Yes. Pat Sheehan? Yes. Alex Easton? No. Orlea Flynn? Yes. Alan Chambers? Uh, no. Is Colin McGrath in online on the phone? Okay, members, that, uh, that breaks down to five yes and three no. So we will write to the minister based on, based on that proposal. Chair? Yes, Pam. Uh, Pam here, sorry. Can yes, I just Pam. check, is, is Colin McGrath no longer with us or is he abstaining? Colin, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if Colin's online. Colin, are you online at the present time? No, I can't. I can't pick him up, Pam. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the vote obviously isn't registered, but it yeah. wouldn't change the result. Yeah, it wouldn't. It wouldn't change the outcome. But I, I, I don't know what the circumstances are. Just for clarity, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Okay, members. Um, moving on then to any other business, and just before moving on to our forward work program, um, do members have any other business they wish to raise? No issues. Um, Item 6 then, may I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 6.1 of the pack. Are members content to note the forward work programme? Content. Content. Okay. Content. Okay, and then the date, time and place of next meeting. I propose that the next meeting takes place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 16th of April 2020, and the room to be confirmed. Are members content? Content, sir. Yeah. The meeting is adjourned. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound.
this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound.